Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Building Business Resilience by Migrating Mainframe and AS400 Workloads to the Cloud. This special webinar event is brought to you in partnership with Microfocus and Infosys. Thank you so, mu so much for joining the, this Actual Tech Media event. We are glad to have you. Uh, if you're interested in you know, building better resilience and really the future of your mainframe and AS400 workloads, uh, moving them to the cloud, this is the right place to be. This is the right place to get all your questions answered. We're going to have an exciting panel discussion today with our experts from Microfocus, Infosys, and a customer from around the world. Uh, th again, thank you so much for joining us. Before we get started, there's just a few things that you should know about the event. Um, my name is David Davis, I'm your host today, and we want this to be educational. We encourage your questions there in the questions box, and we see many of you already saying good morning and hello, uh, but we want this to be uh, educational and we want you to help, uh, help you to solve your technology challenges in the area of mainframe and AS400 workload migration. So thanks for being here. Uh, we'll be queuing up the best questions for a live Q&A session at the end. We also have a couple of special links there in the handouts tab, a link to the Microfocus homepage and the Infosys homepage as well. So we encourage you to check those out for additional information. And then finally, at the end of the webinar today, I'll be announcing the winner of our Amazon $300 gift card door prize. If you're watching this on demand, of course, that drawing has already occurred. The prize terms and conditions can be found right there in the handouts tab. And then I said that we want your questions and we're serious about that. Uh, we also have a best question prize to help encourage those questions for an additional $50 Amazon gift card. Uh, the prize winner will be selected and contacted after the event. And with that, I'm excited now to hand it over to today's expert presenters. Um, welcome uh, our host. First off, Mr. Eddie Houghton. I'm going to hand it over and, and turn over uh, the videos. Um, turn on the videos now. There we are. Thanks, David. And hello, and a very warm welcome to this live panel discussion. Uh, as David said, my name is Eddie Houghton, uh, and I'm the product director for the Microfocus Enterprise Suite, and I'm delighted to be the moderator for this session. Now, as David said, uh, we have a worldwide panel for you today. Uh, I'm based out of Newbury uh, in the UK. Uh, I've been working for Microfocus for over 10 years. Um, and I specialize in our mainframe and enterprise portfolios. Uh, but I've been in the industry for over 30 years as a watcher, contributor, and player. So what are we going to cover? Well, you don't need me to tell you that the IT landscape is changing rapidly. Uh, a combination of technology advances, evolving customer expectations, and new business models are forcing executives to rethink prior IT strategies. Now, there's clear evidence that in today's hybrid environment, where new levels of flexibility are required, many of today's mainframe CIOs are examining, re-examining once again the right blend of platform deployment strategy. Now, for many, deploying to elastic, low-cost commodity infrastructure offered by the cloud provides a genuine new way of looking at performance, cost, and scalability. But of course, questions remain. You know, how do you deliver improved performance? Will you get the same security and resilience as the host? And how will you go about the ongoing modernization to support future business change and take full advantage of the services the cloud can provide? Do apologize, that's my dog barking in the background. This is a live event. <laughs> now, to join me uh, to discuss these questions, um, I'm delighted to be joined by some well-known experts from Infosys um, and Microfocus, uh, with both companies having a long history of working together, helping joint customers in their modernization journeys. Now, we're privileged as well, as David said, to have a panelist from one of those shared customers, uh, ING. Uh, so let me introduce the panel. Um, first is John Marampengopi. Uh, now he's the Senior Managing Consultant and Change Execution uh, Expert at ING Wholesale Bank. And he has led ING's transformation programs um, involving their core COBOL business systems. Next is Gautam Khanna. Uh, he's Vice President and Global Head of the Emphasis Modernization Practice 
and that really spearheads the application transformation engagements across verticals and services. And lastly, Stuart McGill, who I know very well, uh, who's CTO for the strategy in the Microfocus Application Modernization and Connectivity Group. Um, so we have a diverse set of experiences with some unique perspectives. Um, so as David mentioned, this is a live event. Uh, we'll have time for questions at the end, so keep um, submitting those as we go through the session. So let's get started uh, with trends in application modernization and building the business case. So Gautam, perhaps I can start with you. Um, in my role, I've seen an increasing trend of enterprise, enterprises migrating to the cloud. Um, how do you see the business cases stacking up for your clients who have a lot, who have a large mainframe presence? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. So, so I agree that there is there is an increasing trend of enterprises modernizing to the cloud. So much so that ninety five percent of the initiatives that we are involved with have cloud as an integral part of the solution. And, and in my view, uh, it is about elasticity and it's about cost savings. These are the two key main drivers behind it. Although retailers were the first to reap those benefits by, by leading the charge in modernizing mainframe workloads to the cloud, uh, other verticals are following suit. And um, this is a secular trend, as I said, across verticals uh, and to a certain extent, it's secular across uh, geos too. Just to take a few examples, <clears throat> so um, one of our large insurer clients is moving uh, their mainframe workloads of, of more than 10,000 MIPS and a majority of their non-mainframe workloads to the cloud. A travel client is rewriting their entire mainframe workloads, uh, including core ticketing and pricing uh, platforms to the cloud by 2025. A major bank has plans to eliminate seven of their data centers completely by 2026. That includes their wealth management platforms uh, which, with workloads around five, five to 6,000 uh, MIPS. So uh, enterprises choose to do mainframe virtualization for greater cost savings, but that helps fund transformation on the cloud. To take an example, we have an Australian client of ours, uh, mutual client that rehosted their mainframe supply chain apps by redu and reduce their infra cost by 52%. This is probably the first uh, transformation program of this kind carried out fully remotely because this was done during the pandemic. The realized savings are now being plowed back to refactor the key functionalities into a microservices based architecture. Interestingly, you don't have to look at big bang or, or large scale transformations uh, all the time, you can also look at migrating peripherals like storage management um, to the cloud to give good cost benefits. Uh, taking an example, uh, we have we have a luxury retailer uh, that has migrated about 120 terabytes of tape data to the cloud. So just just to uh, close it, uh, on the business case, as an SI, we obviously support multi-year services contracts that subsume the modernization as, as part of a support contract and do this financial engineering to smooth out the initial spikes that might be there for the initial investment that is needed for such a modernization program. So we help clients also on their uh, how to manage the budgets for, for the modernization and, and do it as part of support too. Okay, thanks, Gautam. Um, I'm very familiar with the, uh, the, the customer you mentioned um, in Asia Pacific. Um, and that's an interesting point, actually. In the last 18 months, um, certainly COVID has influenced the way we all do business, um, but it doesn't seem to appear to have deterred our clients in executing their modernization plans. Um, Stuart, is that your view? And what kind of changes has it brought into the industry, do you think? Well, actually, I would probably disagree with that. I think uh, I think COVID has impacted the plans. A lot of the initiatives that were underway, um, in terms of uh, projects that were being delivered, that we're talking about being delivered over maybe the next 12 months, 
uh, actually the decisions had already been made but if you're uh, you know a CIO part of the C suite during the covid times the focus has really been on two things first of all actually keeping the lights on managing the business making sure that the business was was uh, as risk free as possible as it entered into the pandemic but at the same time focusing on the dig digital side to make sure customers could continue to interact with the courses uh, and business could continue but at the same time the the thought processes i think have radically changed for the c-suite because they've seen how uh, it organizations could rapidly adapt that they could move online that they could use essentially infrastructure that they didn't own and that has now extended into uh, the perspective that it core systems because the definition of core system has changed, uh, core systems can now run in the cloud as a matter of course. And therefore, the, some of the concerns that might have been there two years ago have been completely eroded. Hence, what we've seen uh, is, is two trends over the last two years. First of all, customers who had projects in flight have ex actually accelerated. And the size of the workloads that are being moved have increased dramatically to the point where we're now talking about customers with 200 or 300,000 MIPS moving to cloud. But at the same time, we've hit a pause button where, where customers managed through the pandemic to ensure that uh, the business survived, that it was able to do uh, look after its customers and it was look after to any growth initiatives that could be delivered. And at the same time, now looking more strategically ahead in that all of those lessons learned are being applied to mainframe systems being and workloads moved moving to cloud because a lot of the risks are now clearly understood by the business as a whole rather than just by IT. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, Stuart. Um, now, John, I want to turn to you, and, and I know we've had some problems uh, getting your video connected, but uh, I understand your audio, uh, which is great. Um, now, I think you migrated your platforms before the pandemic, so you were presumably better placed in terms of platform preparedness. But um, maybe you could talk through some of the key elements uh, in your business case for modernization, and it would be interesting to learn how your program helped increase business resilience. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you, John. Hello? Yeah. Okay. So we migrated both uh, mainframe and AS400 applications uh, together with MicroFocus and uh, um, Infosys, of course. And uh, we are doing business with uh, these two great partners for more than uh, 10 years. What it basically means is secure uh, support skills, modernized application code, modernized features, make use of new technologies, and save, of course, a lot of costs. And uh, when it comes to how you get there, it is smooth uh, code migration, data conversion, data validation, for the program investment for, uh, for example, Switzerland, which was a business business case for the group. That investment was uh, compensated in six months' time. Okay, thank you, thank you, John. Um, so I think you know, generally looking at modernization projects uh, overall, and it's certainly been my experience, you know, no new modernization or no modernization project is the same. Uh, there are certainly many factors uh, and approaches, and these are influences by, influenced by processes, uh, platforms, people, and technologies. Uh, so back to you, Stuart. Um, building on this, can you share some of your thoughts on how clients can identify what's the right fit for them? Yeah, as you say, every client is unique, but they have a common starting point, I think, which is that the, the cost model of a cloud-based operating uh, platform is of significant benefit to the business. Uh, first of all, there's a dramatic reduction in operating cost from mainframe to cloud. And as uh, we've already touched upon, it's possible to then either reinvest uh, those funds in extending the modernization journey going forward to take advantage of the new cloud platform or indeed can be reinvested back into the business to look at uh, you know, other scenarios that can benefit the company going forward. Uh, every company is unique in that it has a different way of looking at that blend of uh, cost, of investment 
and indeed the the modernization benefit that they're really looking to see uh, that agility that they would like their organization to be able to adopt that scalability that we've been talking about uh, already on this uh, in this panel uh, and so they have a unique way of actually building the business case in terms of how they want that modernization journey to be delivered to their end users. Uh, the, the key element is that modernization in itself continues you know, almost forever in that it's never intended that applications uh, essentially just move platform and take advantage of the cost model without also delivering that agility and the ability to continue the journey onwards to take advantage of the core platform capabilities that are there. Hence, inevitably, we see cost benefit being the reasons why a customer might want to start talking about moving mainframe workloads. But actually, uh, as they go through the process, it's, it's that agility, the business agility, uh, it's the enhanced flexibility that the platform gives them and the development team, and that ability to become far more responsive to business change, uh, that becomes the, the critical advantage. And so, hence, uh, in our belief, uh, although cost savings is the, a tactical reason to consider such a project, it's actually the revenue uh, generating capability that is delivered by the modernization process that really is the key driver for the C-suite. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Um, so, of course, once the right modernization path is chosen, um, clients will then choose their strategy for actually executing that modernization journey, as you as you talked about. Now, Gautam, I, I know that you uh, adopt a zero disruption modernization model at Emphasis, uh, which is actually critical for your clients. Uh, perhaps you could spend a, a few moments talking about how the model actually works. Sure. Th thanks, Andy. So, uh, a major reason for modernization programs not taking off is is obviously the business risk involved if if the uh, program is not successful, and the risks can arise from a number of areas. It can be resistance of change from employees, partners, uh, customers, clients at times. Other risks arise from the uh, complexity. In, in correctly translating and extracting the business rules or the interfaces involved. Therefore, uh, I believe that we need to adopt a holistic approach to modernization to, in, uh, to ensure the program success. So our zero disruption modernization framework or what we like to call as ZDM takes a comprehensive view of all these critical aspects of the program and applies specific interventions that mitigates the risks involved. The this ZDM model looks at all the three modes of modernization as we see it, which is Big Bang, the Strangler pattern, and the coexistence model. Each of these modes is optimal uh, for, for specific circumstances, and um, the, complexes, the complexities involved in rolling out a change in these three modes are handled in a very structured manner in ZDM. So as I said, uh, uh, in, in the ZDM model, we have uh, certain aspects, we, six aspects that I'll speak about, and there are three specific interventions. Now these aspects are the areas where we see the maximum risk for a transformation modernization program. The first aspect being uh, customer, partner, and employee uh, experience. And, and it's a 360 uh, stakeholder experience as opposed to just, just one uh, particular stakeholder. The second most important thing is around business value chains and processes that the modernized system will support. The third and fourth deal with the integration aspects on the application and the data layer. The fifth, is on the coexistence of legacy and modernized system. It may not be required everywhere, but if the risk is very high, you may have to look at that. And, and the sixth and the last one is on having cohesive engineering processes and tooling for the old and the new system. 
So it's it's like a stack or a stack of risk areas that needs to be addressed by the program. Coming to the three key interventions, the first one is trying to break uh, the changes that need to be done into what we call micro changes and micro change management is an incremental set of changes and, and that needs to be looked at uh, to reduce the risk. This second uh, intervention is on the harmonizing the ways of working and processes across the old and new systems. And last but not the least is, is taking a platform based approach to automation where our modernization suite plays a key role looking at cohesive tooling. So uh, to sum up uh, the ZDM framework, the zero disruption uh, modernization framework gives a structure to the program management office to build a much more robust uh, execution model for the program and uh, have a much higher uh, probability of success. Okay, thanks, Gautam. So that's that's very interesting, and um, it's it's you know it's it's good to sort of you know, understand a little bit more about the, the structured approach that you're taking to um, supporting those modernisation journeys. Uh, now, John, um, in the programs you actually completed at ING, did you uh, apply any of the aspects shared shared by Gautam in his last answer uh, in your migration, and how did you actually ensure that there was no business disruption in the program? Yes, uh, we decided to work with only two great partners, in, Infosys and the MicroFocus, uh, and we didn't touch uh, on the on the on the business functionality at all. We kept, kept everything the same. We had multiple dry runs to bring the uh, the bank, the Swiss bank, in one big bank uh, go live, supported the detailed run book, supported by extensive technical functional uh, use of testing, um, and, and make sure that, uh, like Gautam mentioned, all the flows, interfaces has been tested properly, uh, working fine. And uh, very crucial was that we had direct connections uh, and access to Infosys uh, key people and micro, mic, uh, micro focus key people. So that helped us a lot. We made it in time. And uh, as I said, we saved a lot of money as well. And it was a great program uh, for us. And uh, from our side, we had support from the management board bank, the executive board minus one level. Uh, so that was, uh, and, and they were all there to help us. We made it in time. It was a good project with Infosys and MicroFocus. Thanks, John. And uh, again, that's a, it's a comment I've heard from a lot of customers, actually, you know, even though some of the projects, you know, can be very involved, can be very challenging, um, had a lot of good feedback in terms of, you know, the, you know, the enjoyment that people have had in actually implementing some of those change programs. Now, certainly sort of one of the things that I've seen um, as, a, as a common customer aspiration, um, and particularly for some stakeholders in a, in a customer program, is to try and actually load new features and requirements um, into the project that are not directly aligned with the modernization strategy that's actually been agreed by the customer. So, Gautam, maybe back to you. Can, can you know? I'm sure that you've actually seen you know some similar um, occurrences in some of the projects you've been involved in. How did you actually manage this, and how did you work with customers on specific objectives and the concerns that they might have had? Yeah, you're right on that, Eddie. So. When, when any client starts their transformation journey, a lot of aspirational requirements become part uh, and start to pour in from the application and business teams. Uh, and this has a potential to derail the program. In my view, there are uh, three key elements that are essential to prioritize the requirements and features as they come along. The first is we need to have a clear vision and it's what are the related outcomes business outcomes that we are trying to look at. For example, uh, the, the uh, client that I talk, uh, talked about uh, from Australia, uh, the vision uh, from the client and, and the objectives is not only around cost, but also support the immediate expansion of their store network and to unlock the data trapped in their legacy systems. This was to be potentially used for analytics 
in strategic programs like loss prevention and inventory optimization. So that help the business focus and the improvements help focus on, on what is must have uh, and what is not. Uh, the second is an early alignment on the roadmap. And uh, this, this can be made possible by an upfront assessment. And I can't stress that enough. Sometimes clients are uh, very eager to get started on the execution ASAP and may not want to spend that initial effort and more importantly, the, the lead time to get started. But, but a thorough assessment is definitely key. Uh, to understand and to, to get on the uh, same page and have a roadmap that can be agreed. And third, the last one is uh, just most obvious, and, and uh, but it's still the most important one, is a robust change management process, especially you know handling in-flight projects uh, that may be running in parallel. And, and when attempting a phased migration and, and when there are multiple systems that need to uh, integrate that might be impacted by this modernization program. So I think these three things are kind of sort of the, the most important ones to take care in prioritizing requirements. Okay, thanks, Gautam. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think I totally agree with what you said there. And in particular, the, um, the need to actually first perform that assessment up front to know really where you're going and to to make sure you you know you rein back in the project team so you have that clear vision of, of how you're going to move forward um, now data security is of course another common concern that comes up so john um, how did you handle this concern and i'm particularly interested uh, in your view here because i know this was relevant because your data centers are in switzerland so perhaps you can uh, you can talk a little bit about that yes so uh, and the, <clears throat> the data centers uh, were running in Switzerland, and we had uh, a, let's say a semi-structured uh, database uh, in the, on, on the AS400. So we did first the code conversion, then the data conversion, then data validation to make sure that the integrity is there. After that, uh, we invited the, the auditor and also the regulator to do an integrity check on all these uh, migrations to validate that the system didn't lose any integrity on functionality uh, of uh, itself in itself and the quality of the data. So there was um, uh, zero degradation or, or, or setback in, when it comes to data. And also the, the latency between uh, Geneva, Zurich, and uh, the Netherlands was tested properly to make sure that the bank can run very safe in, in Holland. And I'm happy to mention in this setting that we as ING was the first bank that migrated uh, with such a, a big magnitude uh, out of Switzerland. So we are pioneering this. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, thanks for that insight. Um, now, Stuart, um, if I could return to you. Now, you know, Microfocus and our partners have delivered many, many successful projects over the years. Um, and as you said, no, not all modernization journeys are straightforward. Um, so perhaps you can share some of the pitfalls that you've encountered and how do you actually help customers avoid them? Well, I think the We've already hit upon the first uh, recommendation from uh, the whole panel, indeed, as to how do you mitigate the risk? And, and that is a thorough assessment. Uh, a full assessment gives you an understanding about your current application portfolio, how uh, interconnected it is, where the complexities might be, and indeed where there may be some components of existing applications that might need to be fundamentally rewritten simply because there is no alternative as you move off your existing platform to the cloud. So that that is a key part in both understanding the portfolio as it exists and what the sc scale of the change uh, that is going to be needed to move off the platform um, is going to, in terms of what's needing to be delivered. I think that's the starting point. Uh, the second stage is is actually breaking down a project in terms of, again, mitigating the business risk. 
which is not being too ambitious within a single phase to ensure that that value is delivered to the business within a reasonable period of time. And uh, so uh, a second recommendation is actually uh, for most customers not to be concerned about having a multi-phase modernization journey being delivered within the context of a single project. Uh, so in many cases, it's better to, uh, to move uh, the existing application portfolio with as little change as necessary to deliver uh, the new cost model and then to take a second stage to enhance the modernization journey, which begins the process of adding capability, uh, interconnecting to the broader systems and indeed taking advantage of the platform. Uh, by doing that, quite often we see clients able to see the benefits uh, of moving to cloud, uh, both delivered in less than 18 months, anything between a six and 18 month time frame, at the same time as de-risking the level of ambition so that uh, value is delivered uh, all the way through the process. Uh, and, and, and again, uh, any projects that are going to extend beyond maybe two and a half years are already getting into the uh, classic risk of, of a big project um, that you may be trying to en uh, enhance too much, too quickly for the organization to cope with. Uh, and finally, it's you have to take the existing team uh, with you on this journey. They have unique uh, application domain experience. It's not necessarily just platform related. It tends to be the key experience that you're trying to take forward is that application domain experience and the understanding of the business that's wrapped up in the applications. So it's fundamental that the key people uh, that are currently working on applications are kind of incentivized to move to a new platform, uh, actually are motivated by the, the, the new capabilities that they're going to see, both uh, for the business and for their own personal careers, and that that's built into the project plan uh, so that you've got, you're, you're managing all the elements uh, of a, an existing IT organization, not just the hardware and the application components themselves. And I think with those three things, uh, we see the highest proportion of successful projects across all of the many thousands of, of successful customers that Microfocus has seen over the years. So I'll kind of sort of reiterate that preparation phase through an assessment gives you a clear understanding of where you're starting from. Uh, part B is the second recommendation is really not to be too ambitious uh, and making sure that value is delivered as quickly as possible because that bu builds the business confidence in terms of the ongoing modernization. And thirdly, that you take the existing team with you so that you have a, a secure understanding of both the, the business and the applications that run the company today. You're taking that into the future as part of the modernization journey, because that is going to be fundamental to extending the modernization process going forward. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, Stuart. Um, I totally agree with um, with your comments there, and I think certainly um, that's been borne down, borne out in some of the projects I've been involved in uh, as well, and with customers that actually have been successful. And talking about success, I know that that John, um, you've already outlined uh, some of the um, the benefits you had when you moved some of those core COBOL systems um, off the S four hundred and the mainframe. Uh, perhaps you could actually highlight some of those key benefits. Um, and what you're able to achieve um, for ING uh, in the process of doing that? Well, um, uh, taking again the Swiss uh, migration as an example, uh, the landscape is now future-proof and fit in the technology standards offering of ING. We eliminated the risk of shortages on uh, AS400 and legacy COBOL support. Uh, the cost of uh, risk for uh, for this uh, landscape uh, in, in Geneva has decreased massively. In our IT risk, the risk appetite score after the migration, the bank is green, is score, scoring green all the time. And finally, we ended up with a much, much, much lower TCO thanks to Microfocus and Invisys. Uh, as an example, yeah. Okay, thanks, John. That's uh, that that that's very good to know. Um, now you've spoken a little bit about um, good partnerships, and you know you've talked about Microfocus and, and Infosys, and I think it, it's fair to say that uh, 
good partnerships are critical for the success of modernization journeys at our customers. Um, and the Microfocus Emphasis partnership is no exception. So perhaps Stuart, um, how does this partnership uh, help enterprises who are embarking on a mainframe modernization initiative? What's your view? Well, I think it doesn't matter how the size of the project, you know, every project that we embark on is, is actually the fundamental building blocks of the quality of the individuals uh, that are going to be involved in a specific project, uh, their experience, the fact that, you know, they should have delivered multiple projects before, that, that you know, there's very few people essentially uh, managing such a project with the complexities that are involved, who've, who've, for example, have never done it before. And, and hence, the what we found working with Emphasis is that we've built up quite, you know, very strong personal relationships across project teams, across the Microfocus Consulting Organization mapped into the Emphasis company that individually work to the benefit of customers. And how does it do that? Well, because uh, we've delivered numerous projects together, we can assemble project teams that have already worked either together before or have, have worked on uh, aligned projects before and therefore have the experience necessary to know when to reach out and lean either on the customer, on emphasis, on microfocus at any point in that journey, which means that, uh, that both that both de-risks the implementation in itself but it also is likely to result in, in a lower cost for implementing the transformation for the client. So I think the, the fundamental benefits that, uh, of the partnership are seen in the people uh, that have worked on projects before, the experience that they've built up, and how that can be deployed to the benefit of a new client um, in terms of a more flexible, experienced, and frankly, more cost-effective transformation exercise. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Um, so, turning to you, um, go to Stuart. Um, obviously, he shared his thoughts on on learnings. You know what to avoid, uh, the value of partnerships. Um, what are your key takeaways uh, that you'd like to share with the audience today? Yeah, I think we've uh, talked about most of these things. But but just to reinforce that, the the first uh, takeaway would be uh, on doing that thorough assessment, roadmap, and uh, strategy definition, and, and looking at all the solution options, modernization options, uh, carefully based on the workload. The second is to consider cloud definitely as one of the solution options, uh, if not the go-to one. And um, we always suggest to our clients that um, try to see cloud as a single step, like try to move to the cloud, not as a multi-step approach, but if you can uh, move to virtualize some of your workloads on the cloud directly, that would probably be a, a suggested approach. And in migrating to the cloud, the micro focus uh, solution offerings, especially for mainframe rehosting are highly dependable and mature. Uh, and we have done many such implementations together. So, so we, we obviously back it. And, and we always evaluate that as one of the suggested options. The third one is on deploying extreme automation with the optimal tool set. And uh, the, the automation tools need to be cohesive to seamlessly pass the uh, outputs from one tool to the other as an integrated suite of tools. Uh, evaluations and uh, proof of concepts uh, help in identifying some of the uh, suitable tools initially and, and obviously organizations like us can help bridge the gaps where where some of the tooling that may be available uh, is not uh, up to snuff or it is not enough. We do have uh, tools, homegrown tools that help bridge those gaps. So these are the three takeaways uh, from, from my side. Okay, thanks, Gautam. And um, Stuart, do you have any additional comments to add? Or John, uh, um, maybe start with you, Stuart, just to, to wrap up your comments. Yeah, I think the, the key thing is that uh, all of the parties on the call today 
not suggesting that when you move mainframe applications that those mainframe applications to stay in that state for the longer term what we're suggesting is that there can be a phased approach to modernization that will continue into the future hence taking advantage of all of the capabilities of the cloud platform and indeed most of the uh, initiatives that uh, the C-level executives would want to see to support their business going forward can be delivered with the first stage simply being uh, a move off the mainframe into a more flexible and adaptable environment. Um, so I think that, you know one of the, the key takeaways is as the workloads that we see moving get uh, uh, much larger and more complex, this sort of multi-phased approach, particularly for financial institutions, is becoming more and more prevalent. Hence, it's that, you know, have a clear view as to where you want to get to, but don't be surprised if it's going to take you maybe two stages to get there, because that might be faster in the end, and it's certainly going to be more cost effective. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. And it's always a, always a good idea to leave the last uh, comment to a customer. So, uh, John, did you have any closing remarks before we turn to the questions from the, from the audience? Well, we learned that in these type of migrations, it is very uh, crucial that we have a very, very deep code review and identify the problem areas mm -hmm. during all these assessments uh, and on the, on, during the program, test as much as possible but only by testing you will you will uh, um, bump up to, to unforeseen things and um, yeah that's it actually from from my side for the rest it is uh, yeah work with the militaristic approach okay uh, well thank you John thank you Gautam thank you Stuart um, I I think it's been a fascinating discussion. Um, so what I want to do now is just turn to the audience to see what kind of questions that they've raised. Um, there's been a number of questions that have come in as I've seen. I'm just gonna pick a few of those. I'm not sure we're gonna be able to get to all of them uh, in the time we've got remaining. Um, but let me turn to, to a first one that I picked out. Um, and this is actually specifically something that um, that, that you mentioned, Stuart, uh, around the driver for the for the C-suite. Uh, and to, to paraphrase the, the, the question, um, what isn't uh, clear to the audience um, member is uh, whether you're doing a lift and shift of the workload, uh, which would be more likely a zero impact, uh, which was, as you mentioned, uh, Galton, part of the uh, zero uh, impact modernization strategy model that you talked about, or is there true modernization going on, for example, uh, the, the questioner has workload using IDMS, so how would that be modernized when you move it into, into the cloud? So maybe, um, Stuart, you could comment on that? Yeah, I think the the, the first thing to say is it's, it's driven by the client to some extent, meaning a, a lift and shift, if that is all that is desired, uh, is all that needs to be delivered. But for most customers, that's not, sufficient enough they want to be able to continue the modernization journey uh, further than just removing you know changing the hardware platform uh, a key element is at least making sure that the components of any application uh, are able and, and are supported on all the potential uh, uh, production platforms of today uh, the production platforms of tomorrow uh, and that includes cloud hence there are some of the mainframe components that are not supported as soon as you move off the mainframe. There are there's AS400 components that are not supported when you move off the platform. And uh, there is some degree of some refactoring that needs to take place in order to move to a, a stable environment, application environment, that can continue to support the business going forward without significant change. So normally as part of any project, we, uh, we, we help customers identify the key application components that they want to be in their production environment for a reasonable, for the medium term. And then we, uh, as part of the modernization process, we sort of map, do a mapping of where they are today to where they need to be in terms of the future. And that consists of a combination of the, the so-called lift and shift approach with uh, a more, uh, 
a more all-embracing modernization approach. All of that is typically delivered within a single project uh, in order to deliver the value that's required. But yeah, lift and shift, I think, is, is only really being considered by uh, companies that uh, uh, assuming that those applications are not going to be long living. What we tend to see more, far more often is the intrinsic application value that supports the business is going to be there for the long term. And therefore, uh, uh, although lift and shift may be happening right at the very beginning of the project, um, in order to de-risk it, the modernization journey is going to continue uh, within the context of that project to deliver the value. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Um, another sort of common theme that uh, we've seen in the questions um, is around actually measuring the business benefits uh, of moving those mainframe workloads to the cloud. Um, so perhaps, um, Gautam, you could answer this question. Um, how do you help your clients actually measure some of those um, business benefits uh, and convert those into sort of true dollar dollar savings or cost benefits uh, for the organization how do you how do you work with customers in that in that sense yeah so yeah. so the uh, place to start with sorry can you hear me okay yes can hear you fine yes yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so the place to start with is is obviously the strategic imperatives and um, you know agility. Everything is not probably a dollar value, right? Because cost savings is not the only thing uh, that clients are looking at. But definitely, each and every objective is is translated to a measurable outcome, and then we try to deliver. Uh, to those specific outcomes. That's how we um, we look at it. But obviously, th this is this is part of that assessment roadmap definition phase, where you have to come to that common ground, uh, understand what the client is, what are the pain points, translate that to objectives, and wherever possible, uh, measurable yes, but like you said, translate that to a dollar amount as much as possible. But there are obviously some objectives that, that won't be cost denominated. Okay, thanks, Gautam. And uh, John, maybe um, you could uh, answer that question as well. I mean, in what you can share with us, with the, with the audience there, you mentioned um, in the panel discussion itself some cost savings that, that Infosys actually shared, but perhaps you could uh, talk a little bit more about um, yeah, some of the other benefits and how that translated into, you know, cost savings for for emphasis. Sorry, emphasis for ING. To apologise. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Well, um, we, we we started the program. The investment was, uh, as I said, compensated in six quarters. So uh, this was a multi-million investment, and uh, um, we modernised the hardware, we modernised the software, we modernised the database built a future-proof uh, interfacing we save cost on all these elements so in hardware in software in in staffing in in, in cost of data centers so it is, uh, it is a very sweet mix of uh, activities that uh, that comes together and and uh, having a cost a massive cost saving is, is one thing but more most crucial for us as a bank is that we never bring the business at risk in, in, in the program. So the, uh, the auditor, the regulator was uh, with us all the time during this uh, big migration. And we keep them informed. Uh, and also, of course, uh, the, the member or the members of the executive board, because they, I mean, uh, our trade commodity finance bank is in, in Geneva is, uh, is in the top three biggest trade commodity finance banks of the, on the globe. So we had a lot, a lot to lose. So we, uh, Savings, uh, optimizations in hardware, software, service, people, staffing, uh, many, many aspects. It all comes together, and we did it in uh, between two and a half to three years to migrate the complete bank. Uh, bank. I think that's a nice achievement and a good example for all your other clients. And and we and we are happy to 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 uh, to, uh, to help your clients if they need, uh, let's say, a reference uh, uh, call or, or or things like that. 
Okay, thank you, John. Thanks. That, that's uh, that, that's very good to know. Um, I think we're drawing to the to the top of the hour. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to cover all of the questions. There was a question on there that particularly grabbed my attention around security and the attack services. I just think with the time we've got, it's a big question, so I don't think we've got time to answer that. Um, but what we will do is we will follow up uh, on all those questions uh, and, and try to get answers from our, from our panel today on, on those questions that you've actually raised. Now, um, as I said, I think that's all we've got time for today in the panel discussion. Um, I hope you've enjoyed um, this as much as I have, uh, both in terms of the content uh, and the format that we've run this webinar in. Uh, and as I say, I want to thank the, uh, the, um, the, the panelists uh, for their insight and particularly for John, as I mentioned, it's always good to get a customer lens on modernization. Uh, and lastly, uh, before I hand back to David, um, I just want to thank you all for listening. Um, and with that, um, thank you again. And over to you, David, for closing remarks. All right. Thank you so much, Stuart, Gautam, John, and Eddie. Really great presentation. Uh, really excellent discussion on migrating mainframe and AS400 workloads to the cloud. I learned a lot. I know the audience did as well. We had a lot of great questions come in. And thank you, everyone, of course, for those. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to announce the winner of our Amazon $300 gift card door prize. Uh, this is going out to Matthew Hickman from Tennessee. Congratulations. Matthew Hickman from Tennessee will reach out to deliver your prize. And of course, we'll contact our best question prize winner as well. Uh, of course, thank you to uh, Microfocus and Infosys for joining us on the panel discussion today. I encourage you to visit their respective home pages, which you'll find there in the handouts tab. Thank you to everyone on the event. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Bye bye.